I'm P.J. O'Connell for Penn State Public Broadcasting. This edition of the Pennsylvania Parade looks at another in a series of records we've made of black experiences in rural America. This time it's a city in trouble, or so it seems. It is certainly a city with a problem. It is also a city responding to that problem. And this documentary attends most carefully to that response. Problems face us every day. What matters more is our effort to respond. In this case, a gathering of outsiders attempts a response to a problem they are seen to be part of. Succeed or fail, the attempt to respond is what's important and interesting. Williamsport, Pennsylvania, city with a problem. Williamsport is in rural north central Pennsylvania, near the New York border, along the west branch of the Susquehanna River. An old city where fortunes were made in lumbering a century ago. A street of homes is still called Millionaire's Row. The high school football team is named the Millionaires. City population, 32,000 and dropping. Black population, six and one half percent and rising. Leading industries, local government, healthcare, transportation equipment, known nationally as the home of Little League Baseball. But Williamsport is a city with a problem these days, an influx of unwanted outsiders. The influx, the, it seems like the majority of the influx people are black, from what I can understand. And they are not our caliber of people. Maybe some of the black people that have been moving up here have to understand what it takes to, and I don't want to say conform, but adjust to a small community. The influx, if these people want the way of life in Williamsport, they want to live that way of life, then they, I think that they should change their attitudes and their, their, uh, their behavior patterns to fit this area. Why I'm in Williamsport? to save my life. An influx of new residents, a growth population, is something many rural communities might want. But it is the characteristics of the influx that is causing problems in Williamsport. Drug and alcohol treatment facilities from Pennsylvania and nearby states have placed outpatients in the Williamsport area for over 20 years. But in 1987, a local newspaper alerted readers to a changing situation. The number of recovering addicts was increasing. Approximately half the influx population was black. Rehabilitation and support facilities were becoming overloaded, and local officials were beginning to object, sometimes strenuously. By the spring of 1990, as the recovery population grew, as a rash of robberies and muggings was reported, and as the influx of black outsiders became more visible to the predominantly white community, local anxieties increased. Williamsport officials tried to play down the importance of influx-related incidents, but local events kept the issue before the public in the early days of summer. County officials recommended more decisive action be taken to stop the influx of outsiders, but were hampered by legal restraints, and the influx problem took on constitutional overtones. In the meantime, local fears were not calmed. As community concerns grew, black leaders felt compelled to respond to the growing controversy, in part because crime reports identifying some suspects as outsiders and black were attracting increased public attention. And with public opinion heating up, Williamsport City Council met to hear a detailed report on the influx problem. Tonight, this administration, through the staff, various agencies and individuals... Mayor Jesse Bloom led Council off the presentations. ...to you, the citizens of Williamsport, on the influx of the recovering community. We know that we cannot stop people from coming here. After all, Followed by Charles Hahn, who had planned the city's comprehensive community response program 
as an answer to the influx situation. No one can stop people from fleeing the deteriorating drug and crime infested streets of the inner cities to find new lives and better living conditions in smaller communities. It is their constitutional right. Anyone who finds himself in a courtroom in a criminal situation is not a recovery person. A a recovery Ali person Abdul Aziz, chairman of People Reaching Out, a self-help group for the recovery community that was sponsored was by the Comprehensive Community Response Program. Yeah, Mr. Kirchhoff. Yes, I think tonight was a moving Hollywood presentation. I was looking for the popcorn and almost brought my hanky out to cry for a while here. I think the gentleman who walked out of here was right when he said it was a whitewash. I certainly uh, was upset this evening by the socialistic, Marxist-like remarks of Mr. Hahn. Williamsport City Council members were not uniformly impressed by the staff reports. And we've done a wonderful job addressing the needs of the recovering community, and I don't fault that. I think they should be helped. Well, let's start helping the people who live here. They're suffering. I don't think the permanent residents of Williamsport should suffer immeasurably to help half the East Coast. It makes perfect sense that uh, in developing better programs, you develop an attraction. And that's fine. That's a Christian thing to do. But you have to look at, at the cost. I'm not against helping nobody. I, I, I think we should help people. But if they come here, most of them are on parole. And if they come here and get in trouble, then we should have the right to send them back. Thank you. Mr. Carl, why aren't there black doctors here? Why when I go into the bank, there are no black people taking my money? Why is it that the minorities in this city are in the bottom? Community response was widely divided. Why is there any blacks up there where you are? The black people in this community aren't aware as much as you think as to what's going on. There was a news conference held at the Thune Douglas Center which is supposed to be a basis for the black community where people were saying that they're black leaders. I don't even know who they are. If there are black leaders in Williamsport, I wish somebody would stand up and show me who they are. The issue here tonight is decent people, black people, white people, people of every race versus people who are not decent people, people who are bashing people on the head, who are changing the quality of life in our city. The media has been criticized by the administration for inflaming fear. They don't have to inflame the fear. The fear is here. What are we going to do about the services you stay are being strained? What are you going to do to take the strain off of them? I mean, I've done my part individually through the civil organizations, through living personal recovery. Now I want to know what the city's going to do to help, these, to help create a solution to these problems that we're having. I'm a recent uh, criminal, uh, crime victim in Williamsport, and I'd, uh, I'd like to say that I applaud the city council members for realizing that there's a lot of people out there that are very concerned about that this that are not being heard here tonight and i'd especially like to applaud steve Con the lengthy meeting vividly reflected the divided view of the city on the influx issue and local events continued to create uncomfortable feelings for area residents and so it was amid these continuing tensions that comprehensive community response had Charles Hahn prepared his next quarterly report. As we all know recovery has gotten a bad name in Lycoming County due to the association in the media and consequently in the minds of the public uh, of the recovering population and outsiders engaged in illegal activities. For example, talks on... But again, Hahn's report seemed unable to allay local fears. I lived in the neighborhood, just what I've mentioned, the address. I worked third shift. You know what I had to do? I had to teach my wife to load a 12-gauge shotgun because I had three children. Okay? There's robberies behind me. There's robberies in front, on the other side of the street of me. I'm getting tired of it. I wish every one of you guys would do something. I want to see you walk down Friday night at 12 o'clock down Vine Avenue by yourself. I don't know, I'm just not into these politic things like that, but I just, when it's affected me now, you know what I mean? It's affecting my house. 
talk to my neighbors. Why don't you come down and knock on some doors and talk to some people on Memorial Avenue? I'm talking Memorial Avenue up by the Blind Association. No, I don't. I don't own a gun. <laughs> Who's that? I don't know how to shoot a gun. Oh, you mean any across the street? To live, are we scared to live here? Mom, the street's you mean unsafe. Guy, you mean that guy over there? He's the one who got a gun for his wife? Yeah, I taught her how to shoot. Oh, he's cool. He's wondering if we're afraid to live here in this area. Not in this area. Are you afraid to go out at night? Yeah. If you go down in the wrong neighborhood with all the stabbings and drug addicts coming into town. Well, they should keep them where they, they got their drugs. They shouldn't bring them in to bother us. We've got a peaceful community here, and we like to keep it that way. Hey, if I if my husband would teach me to load a gun, I'd, I'd, I'd carry it around with me all the time. But I don't like guns, so I just don't. <laughs> but no, I don't feel safe because how they bring in all these people, and all these murders have been going on since they brought them in. But still, they can't prove who done them, but nine out of 10 chances. It wasn't going on before they brought him in, but it's going on now. People are people. You don't, I don't choose whether they're eating for drugs, alcohol, or what. They're, I mean, can you condemn a person for wanting help? I can't understand that, and that's what I feel that a lot of people are doing, condemning people for wanting help. If it was my son or my daughter, God, I hope there'd be a town like Williamsburg. If they just stay on their own ground, you know. A few blocks away, on Green Street, attitudes were equally varied. Too many of them. There is too many of them, for real. They should stop them from coming up here. I think so, personally. I lived here all my life, and there's no housing for us. The people that's been here, and they come in here and get whatever they want, when they want it, and they need to stop them. They treat me the same. You know, I'm, I'm black, and they're black, and. I don't think they there are no problem. You used to be able to walk down the street and know who you you know who, who you seeing, but now you don't know anybody. I don't know anybody anymore. It's it's getting crazy. As far as I'm concerned, it's more it's more like uh, like the paper stated. See, you, you have the influx of people, and uh, and they're not all bad, and they're not all good. But the thing of it is trying to separate the good from the bad. And we hear about changes, and we hear about a so-called influx, and we hear about the, the people... An area psychologist held a safety seminar for senior citizens in a mixed-race neighborhood. And then we read about muggings, and we read about thefts and break-ins. We read in the paper all of these things, mm -hmm. and then we jump in our imagination, and our imagination begins to fill in what we don't know and to build upon that. And when our imagination gets very, very high, we begin to imagine things that what? It even aren't true. That, that aren't true, that aren't there. We call it rumors and gossip. And sometimes the you know, people who are our leaders don't know the difference between rumors and what's real. If the but it's not all this, it's not all that It's different. not all this influx, so. Uh, you know, I think well, because I think they people say to blame it on them, blame. And then some of these other people that sure. are a little off color, sure. then they're getting in on the act, and I yeah. don't think it's all. Well, this this, so, I mean, this may be, all. this sounds yeah. to me like a political. To save my life. To save the life of my kids and the life of my family. And I know I was born other than being an addict. And I'm a grateful recovery addict, thanks to Williamsport. At the Bethune-Douglas Community Center, located in a predominantly black area of the city, influx activist Joanne Heath led a group of mothers planning a class in effective parenting. What we want to do today is, like I said, kind of come up with a six-month plan as to what uh, I'm Joanne Heath. Originally, I'm from Philadelphia. I've been in this area for about three years now. I am a part of the recovering community, and I don't have a problem saying that. Most of the parents who really will participate are the parents who really don't need because they're already interested. They're already trying to do the best they can. But the ones that really need it here pre presented a better way of life for me and my kids. Uh, growing up in the inner city in North Philadelphia was just not a positive image for the kids or for myself. 
for me, saying that I'm recovering is a positive as opposed to this area thinking it's a negative because I am no longer living the way I did. I was recovering from cocaine and other drugs. Um, and I thank God to say that I'm recovering today, that I no longer drink or drug, and that I have children who I am responsible for and myself. That we should restate that when we... When we uh, I'm a member of PRO. At this point, I am the treasurer, and I have been acting as the... Uh, parenting support group chairperson and I guess board member. See, to me, I don't particularly like the stigmatism of a community, uh, helping community. Uh, when people come here and they move One of the twice weekly meetings of PRO, People Reaching Out, a self help organization for members of the recovery community. PRO was initiated by the Williamsport Mayor's Office as part of the Comprehensive Community Response Program. After a year of activity, PRO was facing many internal problems, as well as questions of its relationship with the wider community. If we're going to revitalize PRO, then where are we going to start from? Is it like, are we like starting over again, you know, expanding out from the recovering community? Or are we going to try to jump from the recovering community? to the community at large. Yeah. You see what I'm talking about, man? It's not jump from the recovery community. We've had some internal strife here. And it's time to go back to basics and start over again. That was the general idea of this okay. revitalization. Our goals are the same goals okay. that we started pro off with. Okay. And like I said, just try to bridge the gap between the recovery community and the community as a whole. I think it's time that recovering people get some positive recognition on what they're doing, their input in this community. I mean, we are trying to mesh into the community, but being as though we have already been stigmatized, I think we should make it known that we are some of those alienated people who are willing to do what's necessary to be a part of this community. I think we should capitalize on the fact that we are recovering. Because just as many negatives as there are, there are a lot of positive sides of being a recovering person who is doing some positive things. And being recovering people and knowing that there are going to be funds to do the kind of work that we are equipped to do by virtue of our own experiences, why then should we back off of that? If we don't do it, it's going to be left up to the intelligentsia who goes to college and don't know the first thing about it. Any kind of addiction. Okay. Anybody else? Job? Yeah, I, I uh, you know, think this has been a great conversation and discussion here. One thing that I keep Charles Hahn, head of the Comprehensive Community Response Program and advisor to PRO. That is laid on us, or are we what we do? Right, that's what And I think that if I uh, was interested in working in Williamsport on housing issues, drug prevention, parenting support, job opportunities, health issues, equal justice, and cultural activities, and I knew that this is a group that wanted to work on it, mm -hmm. then I'd be interested in getting together with this group. Mm -hmm. But if I knew that in order to get into this group and work with this group, I had to be labeled as an addict or as a relocated person or you know, uh, whatever, then I think I'd be a little turned off. And I think... PRO has uh, derived under another program through this city. And what has happened in my thinking and feeling is that the efforts of PRO are being uh, accredited to this other organization. And I'm kind of fed up with that particular position. Uh, what I'm saying behind that is the recovering community is made up largely of newcomers and uh, there is a need for someone to be a kind of broker you know and who knows who will potentially be sympathetic to this and and supportive and who will not one of the beliefs is that the other agency uh, comprehensive was necessary in being the uh, arbitrator for pro in dealing with the other establishments in this area which are primarily white and non-recovering and it was believed that he would be needed to kind of open doors for us however I truly feel that that has not helped us
but possibly hindered us. Uh, certainly a part of the job is to help people make connections and help people to understand that they do have a common interest. I think there are enough people in this organization who speak well enough and know how to present themselves to whomever that what our needs can be met. If not through local government or agencies, most of us have enough knowledge to go even beyond that. And I really feel as though uh, that person has, or that agency, has kind of slowed the growth of uh, PRO. Uh, I think uh, the revitalization of PRO needs to also be done on, on, on kind of a grandstand type of thing in order to do two things. To, to reaffirm our commitment and to bring in new membership, which is, I guess is a key thing. PRO needs to do something as far as uh, a large scale order, maybe a, um, a mild manic demonstration um, about some of the particular issues that face us as a community. If it, if it be a, a, a peaceful demonstration, I'm down with that. And, and, and I think it's really time that it be brought out to this group, that we as a group need to sponsor something along that line in order to make some visible change so that people that we're dealing with are trying to bring in sees pro in the forefront as being leaders and initiating and implementing and carrying it through. You know, and not just those folk, but the folk that we're dealing with see that, hey, these folk ain't no joke. We have to take <laughs> some physical things and do some walking or some talking or some something. And I think that would really help revitalize that vigor and zest that we had in pro. Great. That's right. Okay. Um, everybody knows I've been hired by Charles to organize the community where um, there's problems with drugs and crime, okay? Um, I've created Gene Way was the first chairman of PRO. He was later hired by the Comprehensive Community Response Program to help organize community groups in black areas of Williamsport. Um, the one thing that I've been wanting to do is how, how can I fit the PRO into this? Because the Drug Watch you know, came under a PRO initiative, okay? And Joanne just gave me the answer to that, okay? It's a group is so, uh, I've been thinking about a march anyway. Okay, and maybe uh, Pro can and, and, and can help come up with a march in the uh, in uh, the Walnut Memorial Avenue area, concerning the drugs and the crime that's going on over there. One of the city's responses to the influx problem began on Walnut today. Street. I wanted to talk to you about the meeting that we had last week. Yeah. Now we had a very good meeting. Okay, they tell me um, things kind of quieted down since the meeting. They did, they did quiet down. So you, you see the benefits of organizing your community, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, My name is Gene Way, and um, I came to the area to recover from substance abuse. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm 40 years old now, and um, I am a, a car salesman by profession, actually. And I'm also a previous student at the University of Pennsylvania in the Wharton School of Business. So you feel like the first meeting was constructive and did something? Yeah, I feel that. Okay. Yeah, I feel they felt it. But you know, I tell you what really has them so discouraged. We've had so many meetings and nothing came of it. I see. And that's a discouragement. Sure. You're wasting time just going for nothing. I understand. Yeah. Well, you got, there's one thing different about this is an initiative that's being made by the city. Mm. Okay, it's not you guys calling the city, it's the city coming to y'all yeah. to get you guys organized because the first step in organizing this community is with you guys. Okay, okay? and I'm going to do everything I can to help you to organize. I see. Okay? Yeah. We have established a crime watch and a drug watch program down here. Mm. Okay? Now I got specific complaint forms mm. and I'm going to be bringing them around for you to sign. Mm -hmm. Okay, would you be willing to sign them? I, I tell you, I want to uh, cooperate with you all to the full extent. But like I told you, there's so much happening right in here right now until you, and I'm living by myself, and I'm really afraid to just stick my neck in your well, thing. Because I don't know, because you, you don't, just, you're scared to go on the porch. I understand. You, and you go to bed at night, you don't know if you're going to wake up to set your fire. Because it, it's really well, been see. just a mess in here, if you want to know the truth. Yeah. It really I've done some uh, community work uh, back in the 70s. I'm also a Vietnam veteran, and I have an immense interest in 
community affairs. This used to be a beautiful place. Yeah, he was born and raised here. He ought to know. Yeah? Yeah, I came here in 1929 to have a one drink of water and leave, and that's the longest <laughs> drink of water I was. That's what you stopped for? <laughs> Get out of here. Well, what made you stay? I, I, I guess the water. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been pretty sweet. Yeah. Where are you guys from, from, sir? I'm from Philadelphia, sir. Philadelphia. Yeah, I've been up here um, two years. Yeah. yeah, I believe I found a home. Uh, I created a drug watch program here. But what I'm doing in this neighborhood is I'm setting up that and a crime watch program. Okay? Yeah. And uh, any crime that we've seen uh, going on, that you, you can, in fact, report it. Yeah. Had you any prior experience in the work that you're doing since you've been here? Well, I did some in Philadelphia, um, some organizing. Uh, I was kind of involved in the Democratic Party in, um, in Philadelphia. Not much, because I'm, I'm a car salesman by trade. See, so, huh? Well, what I'm trying to do is get the community. I'm trying to establish the organizations in the community, you know, and that will perpetuate or keep going on, you know, so that when I'm gone, you know, that they're still around. Because what's happening in Williamsport, they're moving into um, 21st century, you know, the 20th century, I mean. Uh, they're moving into drugs and rock and roll, and no longer are they gonna be insulated against, you know, you know, what the things that are going on in the city, you know? The folks that are coming up here from the city and they're bringing their problems with them. Yeah. Hey, see y'all later, man. I got to go. I got to pick up my son. Nice see you Wednesday. Okay. In the last year or so, the nature, the character of the population has increased. We find that fewer people are coming here for aftercare or coming out of drug and alcohol treatment facilities, and more and more people are coming who are single parents with children who are... At a community forum, local officials discussed the influx of recovering substance abusers in into the cities. community. Uh, and that this is happening not only in Williamsport, but it's happening in many communities, uh, not only in Pennsylvania, but uh, in other parts of the country as well. And if you wish to extend Christian charity in the truest sense of the word, you will have to dig more deeply into your pockets and help pay for those additional programs that we will put on every year to provide the accommodations, the educational accommodations these youngsters need. But I love to hear from some of the people who claim they come here to recover when they say that the Williamsport Police Department and our judicial system here has a reputation. And that reputation is if you're going to Williamsport, don't screw up because the cops will rush you and when you go before the courts, they'll put your ass in jail and you won't get out. Uh, life in the big cities, as we've all alluded to tonight, is very different than it is in a rural community. Williamsport welcomes newcomers, but when you come here, you need to respect the way of life that, has, that is in existence here. You need to expect, expect, excuse me, respect our mores and folkways and try to fit in. How do you do that, I guess, is a question. One of the problems I've noticed is that a large portion of the new recovering community are black. Recovering people have been coming here for years, but they were predominantly white. They blended in. They could get a job and no one asked them were they recovering or not. But we have a cultural difference now. And, and I think because of the, the media and, and many negative comments and negative uh, press articles, it's getting so bad that uh, people, uh, you know, I go to the market and they looking at me like, here, take everything. <laughs> You know, like I'm going to rob them <laughs> just because I'm black. And I think it's very unfair. And I think sometimes what we're doing is we're kicking these people who are already down. In many cases, we're not giving them a chance. Yes, a few of them are falling through the cracks. Yes, some of them break the law. Yes, some of them have severe problems. But I can tell you a lot of them are putting their lives together. And my own question would be whether maybe the, the government actually creates as many problems as it, as it tries to solve and by offering more facilities and more um, programs, welfare programs and uh, outreach programs that those are immediately filled <coughs> so that I, I guess the response would be to diminish the resources that are available 
uh, and allow people to either uh, make it or break it. That I do believe that we agree that the government uh, and uh, the federal government in particular can be held largely responsible for a lot of these problems. Uh, the cause and effect relationship, though, I think is where we disagree. So that, in fact, uh, the, this uh, time that you are referring to, which I think may in fact be mythical and never have existed, I believe that uh, back in the old days when it was uh, the survival of the fittest, which is, seems to be what you're advocating, uh, that we may not have had a lot of programs, but I think we had a lot of infant mortality, we had people dying a lot earlier, and perhaps that's part of the philosophy you subscribe to. Those who... <laughs> See, it's a matter of ignorance on the, on the city or the community's part. I mean, they just don't know, you know. They, they look at us as, as addicts, you know. We're flocking to uh, their city, you know. Uh, there's some real, I would call, low-level attitudes about us, you know, from the regular community, you know. But it's just a lack of, you know, of, of not being educated about us, you know. And it's also just no acceptance on their part, you know. They don't want to accept that we're here and we're not going anywhere and that we are, in fact, growing in the city. This documentary is going to be about blacks who live in rural or rural, anybody know what rural is? No. Rural, rural no. America? It's like Williamsport. It's real close to being country, but it's not quite there yet. Okay? Is he going to be on TV? I am Naya Brown. I'm originally from Philadelphia. I came here in 1984 because I really had gotten tired of living in an inner city. I was tired of the drug scene. I had a son at that time that was around two. And I just couldn't see him being raised in that environment. I have a friend that lived here, and I relocated here with him. From New York. Miles, Miles Arella from South. As part of the Williamsport Multicultural Charlie. Drug Prevention Charlie. Program, Nio Brown runs a support group for children of recovering parents to express their feelings about life in a new city. I thought it would be nice for us to talk about our feelings, how we felt when we came to Williamsport. Mm -hmm. uh, or stupid. I feel weird. One at a time. How about one at a time? I feel weird because I was in a new town. I didn't. Damn. I feel like <laughs> the mountains and stuff, and I'm not used to this kind of stuff. I'm used to. You're not used to what kind of stuff? Mountains and all this stuff around me. So. You're not used to the mountains? What else? And I'm not used to being like the streets being all clean. <laughs> You're not used to the what? The streets being clean. The streets being clean. It's all messed up. Dirt. Drugs. Yeah. It's not drugs up here too. What's the difference? But it's not as messy. The thing that happens to a lot of people when they come up here is that they don't know if they're going to survive. Do you get in more fights in Williamsport than you do when you were living in Philly? No. Yes. yes. No. I, know I, I didn't get in any fights in Arlington. Philly. 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 No. Philly. And I was talking to Kiyaka, and then the teacher said, well, y'all do get in line, so we got in line, we were still talking, and the teacher said, well, we're going on the tour around the school, so get in line and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> How did the teachers teacher usually react at her? It. They yeah. acted like she, she didn't have no man. They acted like we were a I'll black negro them. from around somewhere, that's what they acted like. Some white people don't want us up here. Nope. Why do you say that? Because they, they, they like saying, look at them Philly kids coming around here, dirtying up our neighborhood and stuff, talking that bad language and stuff. And, like we and, they, yeah. and they say, oh, look at those little Negroes. Just ignore them. Like we some kind of, like a, like a little piece of paper flying around. And then the principal blanked it on me. She like, well, don't you be hitting on no kid. And the girl is bigger than me. Yeah, she right here to me. And I push Mind your business, yo. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, um, and then the person was like, why you always have to hit on people? I was like, well, somebody hit me, I'm supposed to hit on back. And, my, and I told my mom that the principal said, yeah, I'm not supposed to hit nobody back, just go tell somebody. And I said, what I'm supposed to do, sit there, let somebody hit me? Yeah, and then you always got to get in trouble for that person. If you hit on because that. Because I like white people, I'm not prejudiced or anything, but they start with you too much. They think you can't fight. Yeah, and, when, and, and then when you get to fight, like, and then when you get to fight them, they start. Um, they like, oh, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I'm sorry. I didn't do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just like this girl named Heather when she pushed. Many of the children were raised in were raised in inner city where they are taught that the reason that they are in the predicament or living standards that they lived in in the inner city was basically because of of the oppression of black folks by whites. 
And what happens is they come up here to a white area where they may be the only black child or one of three black children in any given classroom where the schools are white uh, in terms of administration and teachers and the children go through a real culture shock. Yeah, this is Gene Ware, the organizer. How you doing? You know we're having a meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. Yes, it's going to be right at Bethune Douglas. Mm, mm, mm. So you're sick and tired of it? You ready to be a crime watch coordinator? You make sure you be down in that mother alley. Because um, it's, time, it's time for the community to get together on that kind of uh, behavior. We don't need it. Along with some of the um, uh, problems that you told me about, about drugs and, uh, and, and crime, you talked about uh, vacant homes, okay, and how they are adding to the crime and the drugs that is being performed in your area. Also, some of you talked about clean streets, improved lighting, okay, which a lot of folks felt like the improved lighting would help deter some of the crime and the drug uh, selling that's going on in you guys' neighborhood, okay. And a lot of you talked about an a increase in a, a police presence, okay? Some of you feel like there's not enough. Some of you feel like they come through and they just ride right through and they let things just go on, okay? Uh, some of you feel like they, they, they're, they're doing a good job. I know Ms. Fairfax feels like they're doing it. You feel like they're doing a good, good job, Ms. Fairfax? <laughs> I'd like to know what Crime Watch has to do with vacant building. I thought that's the code and health department. Well, the Crime Watch Department does, in fact, but you see, what we're doing here, we're organizing a community organization that deals with the needs of the community. I yeah. mean, whatever the need. Well, I think, I think if we start in the Crime Watch, we should stick strictly with crime and drugs and let the code department take care of their own department. Well, now, let me finish. Now, the police department, where are they tonight? If we're going to talk about crime, the police should be here. Instead of having all the policemen downtown mess with the kids on the circuit, put them out in the neighborhood, in the communities. Um, the community organization that, I'm, that, we are, that I have, in fact, been trying to organize okay, <coughs> is not just limited itself to just singular problems. They're trying to deal with the problems of the community. It's not a drug watch, uh, I mean, a crime watch, a drug watch organization in as much as uh, you think, okay? It's a community organization that wants to deal with 360 degrees of the problem that affects the community. See, I guess you weren't here at first, you know, you don't understand the concept maybe, okay, but it's not a crime watch organization, it's not a drug watch organization, it's a community organization organized to meet the needs of the community. Now, in the event... The black folks that have been here for years are just, they're just okay, you know, with the community, it's never a problem, you know, and, um, uh, uh, black folks come up from urban cities, you know, we we're just a little bit more aggressive. We were there during the riots on Ridge Avenue and, you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X was taught to us in, in, in schools, you know, in colleges, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and, and we, we, we just a little bit more sensitive to, to the situation. Uh, there is just no presence of leadership in your community, you know. Um, nobody, there's no, there's no structure, okay, and what's happening is you have a very loose community as a result of that. Anything can happen in the community as a result of that. The police department wouldn't give a, you know, I mean, they wouldn't give a darn about the problems in your community. Okay, it's time for you guys to have a voice, you know, with, with downtown. It's time for you guys to, uh, to start dealing with these problems, okay? Um, I have this understanding. Well, our aggressiveness when we, when we deal with, you know, business or uh, hospitals or whatever, you know, it's kind of resented, you know, by the local white folks, you know, I mean, you know, this black guy's talking like he's intelligent, you know, you know, or, or, or he's giving me some mess, you know, whereas a local black folk might not, you know, I mean, they've been taught to be real, you know, don't make no waves and all that. And there are uh, folks uh, uh, in the, uh, who are native or long-term residents of the black community who are very resentful about uh, the newcomers. I think that there is some jealousy uh, among the uh, long-term residents about Pro and the success that it's had because there, has, there have been attempts <laughs> to form similar organizations and they haven't gone anywhere. We have proposed a crime watch march or a drug and crime watch march and what we had planned to do was to get uh, the active uh, crime watch committees in the area, speak with those chairpersons and, and have a march December the 1st. 
However, um, in talking to another meeting of pro people reaching out. Because of its outspoken position on influx problems, Pro was being carefully watched by both the black and white communities. At the same time, Pro was struggling to overcome its own internal conflicts. Some, some of them feel kind of leery about coming out December 1st because it's cold. Um, it was suggested that we put it off until the spring uh, because the weather will be better, people you know, will be more active and really want to participate. I said I, I thought we should bring it back to the meeting this evening before we decided to quote unquote cancel, cancel it. What the chief is asked is that he would call the meeting of the coordinators, okay, including Pro. And at that time, you know, we'll all get introduced and the idea of the march uh, will be proposed. Even if there was only 10 of us, it would get Pro up, it would get Pro going. We we'll get pro off the ground is what I was thinking also, and, and just get things going before uh, pro goes down. And I, um, we'll do some good. We don't need, we don't have to have a big one now, we can have a big one later. I piggyback on what he's saying because my feeling was the same, you know, um, initially when we said December 1st, we automatically knew it wasn't going to be warm weather, you know. Um, and I don't... As you know, the situation with the march, which was shot down, through this other agency, you know, uh, we all knew December 1st would probably be cold when we initially talked about the march. However, it wasn't whether it was hot, cold, or whatever. It was the effort, you know, and, and I think to kind of put a damper on the effort, oh, we don't want to do this right now, wait till the spring. By the spring, most people will more or less let go of the idea that this is going to happen. It, it Pro for a while got off track. You know, there was a change in leadership and uh, I, I think uh, the people who, uh, who got involved as leaders had a kind of private agenda and they tried to pursue their private agenda. As a result, they lost members and they uh, lost enthusiasm. And so I think for me, that was one of the things that was like, okay, I understand here what's going on, you know. I'm really in touch with that. Nothing positive ever happens as far as civil rights or rights of folk, unless there had been a march, and I mean, history proved that. And uh, in a way, I think if you're going to get involved in community organizations and neighborhood organizations, you probably have to go through that experience so that you understand what leadership is really about. Uh, due to a bunch of screw-ups, we got evicted. And that, uh, we Pro was facing the loss of its office and, uh, because no one had paid the rent. And, uh, check out some vacant buildings and see if we can find another place. It's like that rent check didn't get there. We had the money was there and that money from, from my account. James. And it didn't get to where it was supposed to be. The, the counterbalance is right there already. They just neither one was, was working. You got a chairman, you got a treasurer, the chairman is the manager, the chairman is responsible for the management of everything. The chairman is supposed to make sure this gets done. The, the, the treasurer was supposed to report back to the chairman that that was supposed to be done. I mean, what else can you do? Here's a perfect example, right? We have at the meeting, you know, we should have a treasurer's report. Mm -hmm. right. And we should have a chairman who is running the meeting, right? Right. Now, you know, the chairman doesn't show up, the vice chairman doesn't show up. And this is this has been going on now for a couple months. Yes. So what can you do? What can you do? I mean, this is really the dilemma. The, the the organization, in so many words, and I hate for this to be on television because I don't want to sound like I'm backbiting, you know. But you know, the the the, the organization has been abandoned by its leaders. It's, it's it abandoned. abandoned. It's been abandoned for all intents and purposes. It's been abandoned by its leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know why that happened. You know, they were leading you down a path that just got into trouble, and people criticized it, and so they just stopped coming to me. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do about that? I think that's the problem. Like Charles put it, we're being abandoned by our leaders. They're not doing what they were elected to do. do. <laughs> My grandmother said, does the house have to fall on you? <laughs> <laughs> wow.
as he says, not much more can be. Read I, I think, and period. That, I think cut dry, we need to just replace it. Well, let me uh, throw this in there to make things a little more complicated. I'm worried about uh, timing. At this point, we have a commitment to meet with city council yeah. members on the 19th. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that uh, we really want to make sure we got our act together at that point because it's a golden opportunity to get, you know, first of all, over this uh, um, bridge that or, or barrier that's been between city council and members of the recovering community and pro. Um, and that was one of the main reasons why we wanted to to call and talk to you know, the council members so that the organization would not be perceived wrongly, that we would present ourselves and be able to answer the questions, if necessary, about us and what we intend to do. Uh, or what Possible changes in leadership were put on hold while PRO met privately with four members of the Williamsport City Council. And it also uh, helps them adjust to this area because we're coming from an area that is predominantly minority. Now they're, the shoe is on the other foot, where they are the, the small group uh, in a large uh, white area. And it's been uh, a culture shock to many of the children. If some small things were added to make my kid be able to identify and to make his the other children in that class realize that he's not that quote unquote stereotype, black that they've seen on TV, which a lot of them have only seen. A lot of those kids have never really interacted with black folk. And it's difficult for them. When they look at them, they see these kids of different color, different hair textures, different attitudes and behaviors, and they're like, they shun. It makes the kids uncomfortable, and the other children are just as uncomfortable because they don't know what to expect. But I think if we introduce some things culturally to some of these children on both sides and share our information, our history, our cultures, it would, it would really make this merger a lot easier. I also need to say that city council, Williamsport as a whole, may as well recognize that the folk aren't going anywhere. We are here, we're staying. So it's time that we do some things together in cooperation with each other so that we can make this marriage successful. You may have to look at what's there and figure out how to best start a program like that. Where do you go to ask somebody who is probably more than willing to help, but who never even heard of the program? And, you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a coupling of railroad cars, you know, if you will. And I think that that's as you become more and more experienced, uh, I think you would you'll be the leaders of the, the tell or suggest to others how some of these things can best be done. But you have to know where to go and who to lean on to get there. And if city council could say, okay, there's, there's bad that's going on, but there's also some good. I think that that would help kind of change the tone of the town. It, and I feel it has to start somewhere. Now, recovering the there's a need for something like PRO. See, because PRO says that they represent uh, the recovering community. I take it a step further and, says, and say this, that in addition to the churches and the community center that have basically in the past been kind of laid back and conservative because they are a part of, of this region, I see PRO also as being very active in terms of being one, one of the voices of the uh, African American community. So it says here, notice is hereby given the articles of incorporations have been filed with the department. The new year saw PRO moving in a new direction, attempting to establish a funding base as a non-profit organization. Certificate of incorporation for a non-profit corporation, organized under the non-profit laws. Okay, now. Gene Way had returned as chairman, but PRO's active membership had dwindled to a handful, and the group's efforts to exercise leadership in the recovery community had faltered. Applying for the 501C is uh, we're not, the, the, uh, John says we're not really clear on our intent or our purpose, okay? So, um, one of the, one of the things which I think maybe we should really try to focus on at this point is that uh, uh, what exactly does PRO want to accomplish? At this point, I think that where we're really stymied 
is that we don't have a focus. You know, we've gone through this uh, 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 long uh, period of uh, being essentially off course and getting involved in some struggles that weren't really relevant to probe. Now I think we got a kind of core group back together and I think we need a single focus. What are we going to focus on? Well, as you said, it's 9 o'clock. Why don't we uh, uh, make that uh, part, the, of the, the part of the next, the next meeting, meeting and really you know, concentrate on coming up with uh, a focus and a plan to implement something that we really feel we can accomplish. Okay, that's good. Last week we had uh, talked about um, different priorities that uh, and, and that we should possibly work on or focus in on one of the suggested priorities. The next pro meeting. Agenda, priorities. At this meeting, I think what we need to do is discuss it maybe a little more and, and select a priority, select a project, select something that we can go ahead and work on. I probably going to wait and hand up those questionnaires at the rally and get people's reactions in. Was that, was that a suggestion? Uh, I think that's a suggestion. The rally. The rally, the crime watch rally? No, the big rally. We, we do really all need to work on that. That's our chance to either really get pro off the ground, I would think. It's, it, what, what I was and you go through a period where there's kind of a slow period. Many people kind of get very fearful and, well, maybe this is it. Maybe uh, uh, we're going to fall apart. I don't think that's the case. I think what's going to happen is that we're going to ride through this slow period. The honeymoon is over. I think that we're going to do very well, uh, if not within the next three months, within the next six months and the next year and years to come, because there's a need for something like PRO. I just can't see our efforts and things being accredited to somebody who's going to take that and put it on his resume and go somewhere else and say, look what I've done. You know, I just really feel like it's unfair. You know, I didn't get into this to be well liked. And I think that, you know, the whole need and desire to be well liked is an impediment to getting the job done. I think the important thing is to try to solve some of the problems. And some people have a vested interest in the problem. Some people uh, benefit from the clash between the races, and they're not going to like me. A part, a part of the problem in this town is that, especially for the minority community, many people will speak up privately. Uh, many people are unhappy and have been unhappy for years, but they were afraid of losing their jobs. They were afraid of many of the things that people were afraid of in the past. You know, and sometimes I think like Coleman County is caught up in a time warp, you know, that 60s attitude, you know, and, and, and sometimes I wonder if I want to go through the struggle with that went through during the 1960s. You know, here it is 1990, almost 1991, and, I, and, and I'm facing the attitudes that we, we faced in 1960. I mean, there's no signs on the restaurants, but certainly, let's face it, there's just some places you just don't go in, in up here, you know, and there's some communities you just don't go in, you know. Uh, Southside Williamsport, you know, um, you got to stay away from there. You can't be walking up in there. The police will, will grab you if you walk up in there, you know. There's a report of Ku Klux Klan Klan over there, you know. And I just feel that uh, this uh, has uh, a kind of uh, element of inevitability about it, that, that people are going to move out of the urban areas into these small communities and they are going to have all these attendant problems and to have the opportunity to be involved in trying to deal with this um, uh, has, has been a good feeling. Actually, you know, I don't care what this city does, the, you know, within, within the local fellowships, they don't, they don't care, you know, they want to recover. And there's nothing the city can do to make it any worse than what it was where they came from, you know. I mean, if they have to sleep eight in the house, they will, as long as they can stay here and recover. You know, because recovery means life to us, you know. In the past five years, things have changed for the better in Williamsport, at least a bit. Fewer inflammatory statements are in the headlines. The influx designation is used less frequently. There are no calls to get rid of the outsiders or to erect gates to keep them out. 
and there are fewer conversations built on us and them distinctions. The older community and the newer residents are learning to adjust. Niall Brown can hardly be considered a newcomer any longer. She's a Williamsport resident with an advanced degree in human services and she's a member of the Williamsport School Board. Joanne Heath is still living in the city where several other members of her family have joined her and there's a new baby in her life. Gene Way left Williamsport saying he was unable to find a suitable job. He's again selling cars in Philadelphia. And Charles Hahn continues as a community development consultant to area agencies and governments, working on housing conditions and the treatment needs of AIDS patients. And Hahn is also an author with his second play now in production. It's about a small city in north central Pennsylvania with an influx problem. He describes it as a farce. For the Pennsylvania Parade, I'm P.J. O'Connell. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.